embassy doing to help the government of Ukraine deal with its well-known corruption problems so that you would have been seen to have been getting in the way or needed to be circumvented by the administration back home? What were your anti-corruption efforts in Ukraine? Um, well, just to, to, to state up front, um, what, what I and uh, the embassy, all of our colleagues was doing was U.S. policy, stated U.S. policy. Uh, it was important for us to help Ukraine with its anti-corruption efforts. And um, just to step back for a moment, you know, uh, I'm sure some in the audience wonder why, uh, why, why that's important to us. One of the things that we discovered over time is that our uh, best partners in the world are other democracies. And when countries say they want to be, um, you know, democratic and they'd like our help in, um, you know, shoring up strong institutions uh, that will further their democracy, we want to help because we think it's first and foremost, obviously, good for those the people who live in those countries. But it's also good for us because um, those countries are our best political partners on the various um, issues that we want to do around the world. That strengthen the United States and um, make sure that we are more secure and that the American people are more prosperous. I mean, that's the point uh, to our, uh, our diplomacy. So it's, you know, it, it was good for Ukraine. It was good for the United States um, that, uh, that Ukraine wanted, uh, wanted help uh, from us in, in this regard. Um, but the thing is, um, corruption undermines all of those decisions. It undermines um, independent institutions. It under, undermines the court when wealthy people are able to buy decisions that go their way, when they're able to influence um, legislation or, or even the writing of a constitution so that they get special carve outs and um, favors are meted out. That undermines um, the very essence of the democracy, which is rule of law, that um, the law for me is the same as for you as, as it would be for the president of Ukraine. And when the Ukrainian people uh, launched the Revolution of Dignity, as they called it in 2014, um, what they meant by dignity was they wanted to be treated with dignity. They wanted to be treated equally. And so when the new government came into power and asked us for help, when active people in the Ukrainian public, uh, in civil society, asked us for help, we and the Europeans and other like-minded were really pleased to be able to help because, as I said at the outset, Good for them, but also good for us because that makes a stronger partner uh, for for the U.S. and 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 our own um, our own goals. So to that was kind of a long-winded uh, wind up, but to get back to the specific question, so what we were doing was a whole range of things in U.S. assistance. We um, pretty much um, every program that we had had some anti-corruption component to it, um, but I'll, I'll I'll just share with you a couple of the things we did. Uh, for example, one of the things which had been done in Georgia after um, the Rose Revolution in Georgia was um, try to help the Ukrainians. Um, and I should state, you know, this, this is all working with the Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian people. It wasn't like we came in and said, this is the way it's going to be. Um, they were interested in, in a quick win with the patrol police. That's the traffic cops on the street that had been known uh, in, in the past to, you know, kind of wave uh, cars down and demand a bribe. And if you didn't give a cop the money, then you'd get a ticket. And so you'd be paying the money anyway. Um, so uh, people resented this, of course. And in Georgia, they were able to launch this fairly quickly. Um, they fired all of the police, um, vetted and trained new police. And so the Ukrainian um, government tried to do the same thing and was, uh, they, you know, they did it in their own way, um, but it was high impact, high visibility, um, and a, a quick win within a year. So that was one of the things that we did. Another, another thing, again, working with the international community, but first and foremost with the Ukrainians, um, because you know, they, they get the credit for these, uh, these accomplishments, is um, working on a, a, um, uh, some anti-corruption institutions. Um, because um, what we know is in democracies that uh, law enforcement and the judiciary are absolutely key again, for that rule of law um, that is, is so important in a democracy. Um, so uh, the Ukrainians established a, um, an investigator, an, a, 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 an independent um, investigating um, a bureau called NABU, which is uh, like our FBI. Um, they also established a special prosecutor uh, against uh, anti, uh, to fight corruption. Um, and then uh, eventually they also established a high anti-corruption court. 
And um, so the idea was that if there were um, was a, 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 a case um, involving a high level of corruption in the government, this independent um, set of institutions where you had vetted people, trained people, uh, independent people um, would um, have a better chance of bring, bringing uh, government officials to, to justice. So I will, I will stop there, but really there, there's a lot uh, that, that we did in Ukraine. And again, just to underscore, this was US policy. Um, and I think it was the right one. <laughs> So that's very helpful. And, you know, one of the things that was happening at the end of your tenure as ambassador, which I guess you didn't know was the end of your tenure as ambassador since you got removed pretty suddenly, was that there was a presidential election campaign going on. And the guy who got elected, this President Zelensky, that everyone's heard his voice now in the phone call, right? Um, he ran as the anti-corruption candidate, but he was also kind of a funny candidate because he'd never been in politics before. The only reason why he looked presidential to the public that voted for him was that he played a president on television. So he was just coming in as you were being yanked out. And was that a moment that we missed because of the fact that you were yanked out? Was there, was there an opportunity that he, he gave us, uh, gave the US and gave other partners of Ukraine that wanted to fight corruption and support democracy? What opening did he give us and did we really take it? <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, one of the things they teach the State Department is never to answer a hypothetical question because you never really know, right? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, since I'm no longer with the State Department, I'll answer the question. Sure. I, um, you know, we didn't know uh, what President, Zel you know, candidate Zelensky, President Zelensky was going to do. Um, but he ran <clears throat> on, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> a platform of two issues. Uh, one was the anti-corruption um, uh, agenda, and the second one was ending the war in Ukraine's east in the Donbas. And, um, and he got a huge mandate on those two things, 73%. And that was in, um, in April of uh, 2019. In July, um, there were um, parliamentary elections, and his party won the majority. He controlled the parliament as well. And um, then he put in place a largely um, technocratic, a largely reformist um, uh, set of ministers in his cabinet. So, I mean, he really had all of the, you know, everything in place in order to move forward a reform agenda. And he started off pretty strong. Um, and um, I'm not exactly sure what happened, um, but uh, in March of 2020, he fired his cabinet and those reforms have been dissipating ever since. Now, over the last month or so, he seems to have taken another change. So I, I don't, you know, I, I don't think that it was my removal. I mean, the question was sort of put in a personal way. I don't think it was my removal that, um, that um, made that happen. But I do think that over, um, over those first months, that first year, that was a big opportunity for, um, you know, not just the Ukrainians, but for um, the U.S. to partner with the new government and help um, help them move forward on the reform agenda, and um, and obviously with uh, the events over the summer, with the phone call, and then of course the impeachment inquiry. Um, I, I, you know, I think it's hard to to say that you know that didn't somehow impact uh, the relationship. Although um, you know the embassy was still working really hard. We had Bill Taylor out there as the charge doing a great job. Um, but you need engagement at the top, right? And you need a clear signal from the US government as to what our policy is. And I think that kind of the domestic um, issues in the United States around Ukraine um, raised a question, uh, you know, in, in the leadership of Ukraine and uh, among the Ukrainian people. Yeah, well, now part of that was that even before you were pulled from Ukraine, the, there was a campaign of disinformation against you launched from here. And, you know, that was in, in this effort to sideline you as the, at least from what we could tell from the impeachment testimony, you know, you were sort of a subject of a lot of bad press, shall we say. And, you know, did you, when you were in Ukraine, did you feel like you had a way to defend yourself? And do you feel like the State Department backed you up when you were the subject of this disinformation campaign? Um, well, in the beginning, um, I mean, this all became public uh, in, uh, in March uh, with uh, um, 
several articles that The Hill published. Uh, and in the beginning, um, the, um, the State, uh, State Department spokesman put out a statement saying, you know, this is a fabrication. Um, so that, that was good, um, but, um, but that was the one and only uh, time the State Department defended me publicly. What was the what was the nature of the disinformation? I'm not sure you want to repeat the disinformation, but you know how did it how did it hit you when you were in Ukraine? I mean, did they know, and did that affect? Do you think your ability to function there? Well, you know, it was a pretty critical time because um, it was um, uh, when when the Hill articles came out. It was right before um, in, in in Ukraine they have two rounds of presidential elections because often. In this case, I think there were 49 candidates running for president in the first round. You have to whittle, and if you don't make 50% uh, with that kind of a field, it's kind of hard to do. Um, so they had to whittle it down to the top two. Um, so there was, then there was a second round uh, in April. So this came out like a week uh, and a half, I think, um, before the first round. Uh, and we were super busy with like a really important um, agenda with, uh, with the Ukrainians. Um, and, you know, I did the best I could to just keep on soldiering through uh, because we had important interests um, that, you know, the elections would be free and fair. That was important to us, important to the Ukrainian people, um, that the, um, you know, Zelensky was, was pretty high up in the polls and, you know, encouraging, um, encouraging good elections, shall we say. So right. we were focused, trying to focus on that and not on the distraction of of the other to the extent I could. Yeah, well, so I think everyone who's seen your impeachment testimony knows that you are strong under pressure. So I have a question that I don't think I could ask anyone else in the world, right? What is worse, being caught in an embassy as it's being sprayed with bullets or being threatened by a sitting president? <laughs> um, well, <laughs> I, I don't know that I have an answer to that, um, but... Um, Here's what I would say, um, you know, no public servant um, should ever be threatened by an American president. Um, it's, it, it's just not right. Uh, it doesn't mean that public servants don't sometimes do things wrong and need to be held accountable, um, but that's not the way to do it. And probably no embassy should be sprayed with gunfire either, <laughs> right? So. That's well, awesome. yeah, I don't mean to laugh because, I mean, this is a serious issue, obviously, the security yeah. of people overseas and, um, you know, speaking as a former ambassador, it was, you know, often my number one concern. Right. I think these episodes are going to feature in the action movie of your life that will be after your book, right? Um, so, so looking back, so you were part of the impeachment process, number one, there was obviously, you know, impeachment process number two, but looking back on impeachment process number one, because this is how everybody got to know you, you know, what do you think are the major takeaways that we should learn from that impeachment process? Well, I guess the first thing is obvious, um, but, um, you know, it's a political process. It, it's not um, a process, um, you know, that goes through, um, you know, the judicial branch, shall we say. So mm -hmm. it's a political process. So, you know, I think it was clear to everybody from the outset that um, the Republican Senate that was in place at the time was, was not going to convict um, President Trump. Um, I mean, I think that was pretty clear to most observers. Um, so the question, you know, for me became, and I think for many, is um, how many how many Republican senators are going to be willing to hold the president accountable? And you know, the answer was one. And I think that sent the president a message. And what we saw in the months after that um, decision uh, by the Senate, uh, we saw uh, a pandemic. Um, and then we saw, um, you know, unrest on the streets after uh, the murder of George Floyd. And we saw the same kind of leadership uh, and frankly, the same kind of self-dealing um, continue. And so I think that's the lesson of the first impeachment. Yeah. Well, you have to, hold, you know, no matter how uncomfortable and, you know, back in the Watergate era, um, uh, the, Republican senators were willing uh, to hold, you know, in the end, they were willing to hold Nixon uh, accountable. Uh, and that did not happen in 2019 nor in 2020. Yeah. 
Well, you've spent a lot of your ambassadorial career working in these fragile democracies that came out of the Soviet Union. And your answer makes me think that now the U.S. looks like a somewhat fragile democracy to the rest of the world, right? So, you know, we had a, a question from Caroline Dorsa that she submitted before the session started. And I do, I'm going to sprinkle in the question some of you wrote in, in advance throughout this conversation. And we also have time for the live questions at the end. So don't forget to put things in the Q&A. Uh, but Carolyn Dorsey said, how can the U.S. restore its own reputation abroad? And I'm wondering, what can U.S. Diplo you know, diplomats say about democracy now without looking hypocritical? Yeah, yeah. I think that's a really good question. And I think it's, it's something that um, all of us in the foreign policy world, um, and I think the new administration, um, we're all asking ourselves that question. And everybody you know, comes to their own uh, decision on these things. Um, here's what I would say, um, and I think, um, you know, Secretary Blinken, um, National Security Advisor uh, Jake Sullivan have been very eloquent on this um, topic, and I happen um, to agree with them that um, the, um, you know, our foreign policy uh, needs to serve the American people. And um, what we have discovered uh, over uh, the last uh, little while is that our foreign policy has um, been animated and um, has been strong because of the example that we set here at home. And so our current um, domestic um, turmoil uh, has, has uh, made us um, uh, less influential abroad. There are other reasons for it as well, um, but that is certainly one reason. And so I think the first task has to be um, domestic renewal and um, attending to um, you know, uh, the, the divisions within America um, and, um, and, and, and addressing them uh, in, in a way that people feel meets their needs. That is a big, big task. And it's not gonna be done overnight. It's probably not even gonna be done in, I don't know how much time it will take, but it's important that we get started. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, you know, our foreign policy can't wait for um, domestic renewal to be completely <laughs> uh, in place. But I think that when we go overseas, when we talk to our counterparts, when we talk to foreign audiences, we need to own it. We've got problems. And, uh, you know, this is not something that the founding fathers did not foresee. You know, they talked about, you know, kind of the perpetual task of creating a more perfect union. Um, but we have a lot of work and we need to do it now. And we need to own that, including when we're overseas. And maybe we can learn from other countries in terms of their um, challenges and uh, what, uh, what they dealt with. I mean, one of the things that um, you know, I've seen overseas is that um, when, uh, when countries become less democratic, uh, the forces that are um, kind of uh, uh, trying to engineer that they go after the judiciary because rule of law is antithetical to democracy. They go after the election process because the idea of, um, you know, people being able to freely elect their leaders and that leaders worry that they might not get reelected next time unless they are responsive to the people. Um, they go after the media, uh, you know, that important institution that tells us what's going on. And they go after civil society, particularly activists, particularly minorities. And that list, if you think about it, and you think about the United States over the last little while, is um, familiar. And so I think that there are, um, there's a lot we can learn from other countries. There's a lot we can learn from history. Um, and there's a lot that we can do to renew our own democracy, even as we work with other countries uh, and helping them with their democracy. And I would just say that we don't go overseas um, and you know, provide assistance or have discussions about these issues because we're perfect, because we are not. We do it because we know it's important for us um, and we know it's important for them. And so I think that um, you know, people may disagree with my view on this, but I think we still have a strong voice on this. And at least in my um, you know, discussions and emails and everything else with foreign counterparts, um, you know, they're still looking to us uh, for um, inspiration, for help. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm hoping, I'm, I'm hoping that we can do that. 
I, I know I've kind of answered this very long, but I, I would just like to say one other thing. Yeah. So when I was uh, a, a, the deputy chief of mission in Ukraine um, um, back in the early 2000s, um, that's the number two in the embassy, we were doing a big event in, the, in one evening. Um, this was during the war in Iraq. Uh, we were doing a big event, uh, a human rights event. And that morning, the morning of this uh, evening reception uh, event um, to honor some human rights activists, um, the news broke about Abu Ghraib and um, the torture um, by our service members of, um, of uh, you know, some, some of their um, uh, prisoners. And, um, you know, I mean, <laughs> I was kind of beside myself. Uh, I mean, what do you do? You, you're standing there talking about the importance of human rights when this terrible story breaks. And, um, you know, I decided that what we needed to do was own it and to say, you know, say out loud, we know that all of you have seen this, the news um, about this terrible event. Um, we hope that this is an isolated incident and make the point that bad things happen everywhere in every country. And the important thing is how one addresses it. And that goes back to the importance of you know, our foundation, which is the constitution, which is our laws, which is our strong institutions. But the other thing we found out, or at least I have found out over the last uh, couple of years, is it's also um, down to individuals making the right choices, even in difficult circumstances, to shore up those institutions, to shore up those documents, um, like you know, laws and the constitution, which are just pieces of paper if there aren't people actually animating them. And um, yeah, and so I guess what I would say, um, to make a longer answer even longer, is that, um, you know, there's a lot we can say about what went wrong over the last couple of years, but there's a lot we can also say about what went right over the last couple of years. When you think about um, the um, challenges that our electoral process faced, and you had, you know, the poll workers in there, you know, some of them for months doing the right thing, showing up to work, under a lot of pressure. You had had election officials doing the right thing. You had nonpartisan judges acting according to the law. I could go on, um, but I think that that is um, actually, um, you know, an inspiring story about American democracy. And I think we need to remember that as well, even as we look to, um, you know, what we need to do better, because there's a lot we need to do better. Well, that was a very helpful answer, and actually, you answered a whole series of my questions. So let me let me pull up a question from somebody in the audience, which I think is related to this cluster of questions. So John Greenwald um, had a question. You know, how can U.S. diplomacy push back on illiberal democracy? Right. So countries that are even farther along in this process of, of democratic challenge than the U.S. is, and so if we're in the middle of trying to solve these problems ourselves, how do we do that pushback? And you know, how do we do it while we're still renewing ourselves in a way? Yeah. Well, you know, I don't. I don't think it's an easy path. Um, I think. I think you know, one thing is working with with partners. Um, so the rest of the EU, and I think the EU actually is probably the most important um, partner for these two countries. But all of us working together in tandem, um, congressional hearings that is always helpful um, to kind of put a spotlight on, um, you know, look at the possibility of sanctions. Um, I recently read something about um, reopening uh, the radios. I mean, as you know, Kim, um, RFERL over the Cold War years was hugely influential in um, what we used to call Eastern Europe, now Central Europe. You know, maybe, maybe we should, um, you know, open radios again or, or some sort of media so that free media, independent media, so that people know the truth of what is going on. Because um, certainly in Hungary, um, the media has been captured by the state. And so it's hard for people to know uh, what, is really, uh, what is really happening. Um, I also think that, uh, you know, the old fashioned virtue, you know, not virtues, but the old fashioned way of engagement you know, working with these countries, having, you know, you know, from the bottom up, you know, the embassy, everybody in the embassy, everybody at the State Department, but also more senior leaders engaging with Hungarian leaders on, you know, this is what is um, important to us. 
And this is what is important to you as well. And this is why. Um, so, um, you know, there might be assistance support, although certainly in Hungary, um, uh, you know, um, they followed the Russian model uh, in terms of um, calling, you know, basically punishing um, individuals who accept foreign assistance as foreign agents. Um, and so that can be um, obviously uh, an uncomfortable place to be. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a range of tools um, and I think we need to start. I don't think we've been um, forward enough, if that's the right word, strong enough uh, uh, on this issue uh, and, and, and we need to do it. If for no other reason uh, than that these two countries, uh, you know, Poland, Hungary, but other countries as well, um, are members of the EU and they're members of NATO. And, um, you know, those organizations are organizations that are also based, the reason they're successful in part is, um, is because they're based on common values. Um, it's not just the interests, it's the values. And so we can come to consensus decision-making and so forth. Um, but once um, countries no longer share those values, um, it becomes much more difficult to work as you know, a collective cohesive uh, unit. And um, that is terribly concerning to us. I would also say that both countries are very interested in um, uh, partnering with the US military. And so maybe that's another area where um, you know, we, could, uh, we could apply some, um, you know, a little stick there. Um, with the carrot of, um, you know, work, work with our military, but you need to keep on moving forward in a democratic path. Well, all, all the things that you're suggesting suggest that there's an important role for strong diplomacy. And when I went back and I reread your opening statement at the, you know, impeachment hearing, one of the things that was really moving about it was your plea to Congress to basically protect and bolster the State Department because, Frankly, under the last administration, you know, the budget was slashed, the department was reorganized, lots of current diplomats left, top jobs weren't filled, morale was low. And so, you know, if a lot of the answer to the question of how the U.S., you know, comes back, I guess is the current administration puts it, and wants a, a powerful diplomacy, you know, wants powerful diplomats to be able to front that effort, what can be done to fix the State Department after all of the stuff that it's been through during the last administration? Yeah, so there have been a number of studies um, on this um, that have come out recently, um, many of them targeted for <laughs> November um, 2020, uh, in part because, um, you know, there was going to, you know, either um, President Trump was going to be reelected or um, uh, President Biden. And so Harvard and Georgetown actually um, partnered on one called, um, and I've got it here, it's called um, a US diplomatic service for the 21st century. And it's actually pretty good. I wish I could read you the whole thing, <laughs> um, but, um, but I, I promise I won't do that. Um, but I guess just to start at the very basics, um, it's that we need to kind of, um, you know, redefine what the mission of the State Department is and um, give the State Department a mandate. And, you know, I'm obviously biased. I think the mandate should be that the US um, State Department should be in charge of US foreign policy. Um, and I think that it, um, but, but I think it needs to be reimagined for the 21st century. You know, what are the challenges we have today? And how do we meet those challenges? Um, and are they gonna be resourced enough? Um, because, um, you know, honestly, you could double, triple, quadruple uh, the budget of the State Department, and it's not going to make, you know, it's like pocket change for the Pentagon. Um, there is a role for our military, but over the years, and this is not just recently, but over the years, because um, other agencies, um, including the intelligence services, are so much better resourced, the solution to a problem has to be a military solution or an intelligence um, solution because the State Department doesn't have the personnel, doesn't have the expertise, doesn't have the resources to bring a solution to bear. Um, but I would argue that um, you know, we should be the first resort. Um, we are cheaper. <laughs> and um, you know, frankly, um, I, I think we can get really good results. 
over sometimes over time. Uh, and um, I, I think that's something that really needs to be looked at closely and I would say urgently because the State Department is in disrepair and um, needs, to, um, needs to be revitalized. I think that is a, a, um, uh, a national security priority, frankly. Um, there are many other recommendations in here. Um, and I, I would just, yeah. So I, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that, unless you have another question about this. Yeah, well, actually I have a sort of a follow-up. So one of the members of our audience, Kristen Ritterick asked a question which probably goes to the heart of what it's like to be in the middle of um, an agency that's being rebuilt. You know, she said, do you have any advice for persevering as a career federal employee when progress moves slowly and resources are limited? Because it's going to take a while to build the State Department back, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, you can imagine that <laughs> I've counseled a lot of people <laughs> over the last number of years as to you know, what their personal decision um, was gonna be and you know, what did I think and various other things. So here, here's what I, I tell people. Um, I mean, I think that public servants, whether you're in the civil service, whether you're in the foreign service, um, we are the glue that holds the whole ship of state together. And we, we are the subject matter experts. Um, we are the people who have the uh, institutional knowledge, the continuity, the relationships and everything. And, you know, we all, um, although there's, you know, been some doubt about this over the last several years, but we work to implement a president's vision and agenda. That's what we do. And, um, you know, if we don't like that agenda um, in the, you know, one has to make a decision as to whether one can continue working uh, for uh, that agency or, um, or quit. But the other thing that I tell people is that um, it's more, um, more important than ever during tough times when there are fewer resources, when we need to work smarter and harder, um, when, um, when maybe there are political issues at home or questions abroad, that's when you need a professional foreign service the most. It's not during the good times. Because then, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure when the good times are, but, you know, then you can kind of skate along. Um, but it's when there are challenges that um, I think uh, it is most important to have uh, a cohesive um, public service that goes to work every day and works for the American people. Well, this is great. It turns out we actually had several questions in the queue that were actually on exactly this topic of trying to build back the State Department. And I wonder if I can take some of those in a slightly different direction, which is that the one thing I've noticed at the change of every administration right, is that the State Department has more Senate confirmable jobs at the top than any other department in the US government. So I actually went and counted before talking to you today. So there are 44 jobs at Maine State, not just the secretary, but all the deputies and under, you know, all the way down. There are 10 jobs at the UN, 16 jobs at USAID, 11 other jobs that are US seats in, in international organizations, plus 189 ambassadors, all need Senate confirmation. So what that means is that you, know, you get a new president in office and it takes a long time before the president has their team on board. So is that crazy? <laughs> and does, does that actually affect the way the State Department works? It does. I, I mean, I think it affects every agency, but because we have so many political appointees that need to go through the um, confirmation process um, and, you know, just appointees that need to be Senate confirmed, uh, it slows us down. And um, this year is no exception. And I, I mean, crazy is a good word for it um, because for several months, um, you know, in a, in a good transition, but usually it's much longer. Um, it, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to figure out what, what is our policy? You know, is it a continuation? Um, how should we, um, you know, react and behave and, and so forth? And, um, you know, I'm probably making it sound a little, um, a little uh, more dire than, than it is because in the absence of new instructions, uh, you know, one continues uh, with, uh, with the old policy, but it's, um, it is a time of confusion and there's, and our, you know, allies and partners and adversaries are all trying to figure out, you know, who's, not, who, you know, who's going to be in which job and how can we get to that person and find out what's really going on. 
And so there's, there's a lot of jockeying too, which is probably not necessarily helpful either. Right. Well, this is the, one of the characteristic features of US government and another one that affects diplomacy in the State Department is political ambassadors, okay? So I don't know how many people out in the audience understand that a lot of US ambassadors are actually donors or close personal associates of the president rather than career diplomats. And this has been a controversial practice and President Biden, when he was still a candidate, you know, has come under a lot of pressure to reduce the number of political ambassadors and, and name more career diplomats to high positions. And I'm wondering what you think about that, because that's obviously going to be an issue as all the new ambassador jobs get rolled out. Mm -hmm. Do political ambassadors really well, represent the U.S. well? Yeah. Um, so I think, uh, I guess, you know, big picture, I would say three things. Um, the first thing is that um, probably every country in the world, um, minus a few, has a couple of um, political appointees. Um, some might not have any, but no country does what we do with, um, you know, 50, 60 percent, whatever it is, ambassadorships and other, uh, other appointments in the State Department. No co other country in the world does that. And so you have to ask yourself, <laughs> why? <laughs> um, because in other countries, their leaders also have friends and, and um, donors, maybe not to the extent that we do, but um, you know, they also have um, people that um, they need to please. So, I mean, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing I would say is embassies, um, just to take the embassy as a unit, that's our operational unit overseas, right? Um, that's where uh, the policy for the most part gets implemented and we're dealing with the host country, you know, uh, day to day, hour to hour, we're reporting back, we're doing stuff, et cetera, et cetera. Um, maybe that's not as dramatic and easily understood the kind of activities that we do um, as a military unit overseas, but it's the same thing. That's, that's our operational unit. And so how would the American public feel if, for example, um, you know, a big donor uh, were named to head up um, our forces in South Korea? I mean, it's the same kind of a thing, right? Um, we actually did just have a political ambassador who actually was a military general, um, but um, in South Korea. So, um, you know, they, over time we do develop an expertise in subject matter, um, competence and so forth, languages, other skills that help us work in the countries that we're assigned to. Um, I would, um, you know, end with uh, a little crack that uh, my friend, uh, uh, Ambassador Tom Countryman uh, made once, which has always kind of stuck in my head, where he said, you know, if you don't have professionals in, um, you know, in, in, you know, most of your key jobs, um, you've got an am amateur foreign policy, by definition. Um, if what you've got is amateurs, um, that's an amateur foreign policy. Um, but I would close on a more positive note with regard to political appointees at the State Department. I think there is a role for them, and I think it's important that we have political leadership within the State Department. So we know what the president, whichever president it is, is, um, you know, what do they want in um, our area of the world in, um, in um, you know, a, a particular area like climate change or whatever. It's important to, um, to have a certain number of political appointees to, you know, to facilitate um, that give and take um, between the political leadership. So that's the first thing. The other thing is I've worked with many, many political appointees over the years, and many of them are just outstanding and the country is better their service. Uh, well, thank you. So we're now at the point where I wanna, I've been interspersing some questions from the uh, audience and some of you will recognize your questions popping up in, in mine too, but I, I wanna switch over really to full-time questions coming from the audience. And so one comes in from uh, Bill Ashbrook who asks, do you think the State Department has any room for technological innovation? <laughs> like what is the state of tech at the State Department and does it need to be improved? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, that yes. Question. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> how does that work? <laughs> I think it's a priority. Um, I mean, today, I mean, we all know about the solar winds 
uh, hack, um, but today Politico broke a story, which I think it wasn't quite clear, but it seems to be different from solar winds that um, the Russians um, hacked into our systems and stole millions of, um, of State Department unclassified emails. Hopefully they didn't get into the classified part. Um, so I, 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 I think there's, you know, the very important issue of, I'm probably going to use the wrong words because I'm not very technological, but hardening up our systems in a way that keeps us flexible and able to work, um, uh, but um, doesn't allow others uh, to penetrate our systems. And then it's just the, um, you know, um, the, the, the equipment we have and how we use it is, um, you know, pretty retrograde. Um, I, I, I fear that, it, so I, I'll just tell you that when um, Secretary Powell became Secretary of State, he was shocked. Uh, so this would have been in, I think, 2001. He was shocked to find out that um, we were still using Wang computers. It took about three or four years for us to completely get rid of Wang computers. I think we're in the same place now, um, 20 years later. Um, and we really need to uh, look at how we do things. And, um, and I guess first, what our needs are um, and, uh, um, and then figure out um, a, a, a better technology for us to be able to do that. Yeah, so let me uh, flip over to a couple more audience questions here. We have a, a really good question from Robin Whiteley in the audience. Can you point to another democracy that is doing things right, even better than the US? Right. This goes to the question of are there countries the US can learn from? And I wonder in your diplomatic experience whether you've actually thought about that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's interesting. I guess, um, so I, I guess here's what I would say, um, that, um, you know, many countries do things um, in a way that, um, you know, we could, we could probably learn from. I mean, um, and uh, I, I look at, um, um, for example, uh, Canada um, and some of the Scandinavian countries um, where they um, seem to be very uh, responsive to, um, to their electorate in terms of what they want um, and, and what they need. I think of you know, public health services, for example, um, that you know, is, is something a majority of the people wanted and, and they got and it's now um, something that they have. Um, also in terms of, um, uh, you know, this is a really good question. Um, I, I, I think different countries do different things well. Um, and I haven't really thought about um, this particular um, uh, issue, um, but you've given me something, something to think about. I think we're all now looking for model democracies, given that everybody seems to be in, t in trouble in some, in some way. And, and I actually think that, um, you know, often as Americans, we're surprised to find out that, um, you know, some democracies don't have um, presidents or that a democracy like um, the UK, uh, England, has a queen. <laughs> you know, they come in different shapes and flavors, um, but it's the principles, uh, you, know, um, yeah. you know, law and democracy and elections and so forth and freedom, really, uh, yeah. of individual um, that, you know, kind of binds all of us. And I think some of us do uh, do things better than others. And it's often culturally um, uh, normed, um, shall we say, that things that might work in France wouldn't be so great here or vice versa. Um, but it doesn't mean that we can't learn from others. Yeah. So I want to make a pivot from this to some questions that are a little more personal coming up from the chat. So here's one that kind of bridges between them from Susan Ragev. She says, you know, as an immigrant yourself, what advice do you have for young people of color, especially those that come from immigrant backgrounds, or who aspire to be foreign service officers, when the State Department views them with suspicion? She points out that Congressman Kim, who's a Democrat from New Jersey, recently spoke about how the State Department banned him from working on Korean issues as an episode because of his background, despite receiving a clearance. So for people who want to go into the foreign service from you know, immigrant backgrounds, is there some advice you might have on how to how to cope? Yeah, well, um, and and I would just, yeah, that's not completely um, um, unheard of, and 
certainly when I joined the Foreign Service, because I have Russian background, I was told, this was during the Cold War, I was told I would never serve in the Soviet Union. Um, so I'm familiar with um, that particular kind of feeling. Um, I, um, I think that this is something that is being addressed in the State Department. I read the same article or, or um, news coverage. I think it is being addressed. And I, I want to say there might even be. Anyway, I'm not sure how it's being addressed, but I think they're looking at it and trying to make things more transparent. And um, um, and I guess um, I would I would leave it at that. But here's what I would say, um, you know, separate from the, the particular issue you just raised, is that there are many um, people uh, who work at the State Department who are immigrants or who um, are you know, second generation Americans. And I think you know, part of that is that you know, like you, um, they have um, you know, either um, you know, lived in a country or they're familiar with the culture. And so they're interested in traveling and history and you know, kind of bridging um, between two cultures and two governments and, and, and so forth. And so it's a natural kind of a thing that you would uh, that um, immigrants would want to work um, at the State Department, I think. And I think we have a lot of the skills uh, that are necessary. You know, that ability to kind of the spider sense of um, what are people really saying here when they're um, because people communicate with words, but they communicate many other ways as well. And if one doesn't have that spider sense, which can be learned uh, with experience, but um, you, you're you're listening to the words, maybe through an interpreter, but um, you know, often immigrants have um, you know really, really uh, great language skills, and they have all the cultural cues uh, that can really help us um, move our policies forward because they can present them in a way um, that is more um, um, acceptable and culturally appropriate, and ultimately perhaps successful. So I think that. Um, having uh, immigrants and um, and uh, you know uh, second generation folks at the State Department has actually made us a more um, successful culture and uh, uh, institution. And it, it's um, you know one of the things that the State Department is trying to do. You know from Secretary Blinken on down, and it's also in um, this report that I mentioned that uh, Harvard and Georgetown worked on is um, trying to um, make the State Department a more diverse uh, institution. So uh, in part that is, um, uh, in part that is, that is also, I think, um, uh, immigrants and where people come from. Because again, we need to be reflecting America as it is, not America as it was 50 or 100 years ago. Yeah, this pivots nicely to a question that Ben Nathans is asking. Uh, pointing out that you and Alex Finneman and Fiona Hill, who all testified and, you know, as fact witnesses before the, the Senate Intelligence Committee, are all immigrants to the United States. And he, um, he says, you know, why are the most incisive voices in the 2019 impeachment hearings those of immigrants? <laughs> and can you, do you think it's an immigrant thing? <laughs> well, I mean, first of all, thank you for the compliment. Um, but I'm not, you know, I'm not sure I actually agree with the, the, the premise of the statement. I, you know, when I um, either watched or read the testimony of all of my colleagues, um, I really think that they were, um, you know, they addressed um, the committee, uh, the committees, um, both with integrity and with eloquence. Um, and that's what I would expect from any public servant that is, um, called up in, in such circumstances. Um, you know, to address the immigrant part of it, you know, I, I, I think all three of us addressed that in our testimony actually, because, um, you know, to be an American by choice is perhaps slightly different than being American by accident of birth. Because you, you have to affirmatively think about this. And um, speaking for myself, you know, I affirmatively made that decision that I wanted to be an American citizen I was brought up in this country since the age of three. I was educated here and I felt American and that's what I wanted to be. And, um, you know, partly because uh, I went to Princeton and the nation's service, partly because of my parents, um, I wanted to give back. And that's why I joined the Foreign Service. Um, and, um, and I think many immigrants have that same sense of gratitude um, and understanding also that, 
you know, um, democracies, um, you know, they need work. Um, they need um, participation. Uh, they need pe public servants. It's not, um, democracy is not, uh, you know, a spectator sport where, you know, we vote once every four years uh, and then we go home and we don't think about it again. Um, we need to constantly renew our democracy. And I think we've seen over the last couple of years how many challenges we have and how much we need to do. But you know, the, the, the one thing I would say is that I chose the Foreign Service because that was something um, I was interested in and it animated me and I thought I would be good at. Um, and it was still giving back. And I think you know, each of us in our little way, whether it is um, you know, being, being in charge of the neighborhood um, you know, park to make sure that all the litter is picked up uh, you know, once a month or whatever it is, um, you know, all of us are contributing to, um, to make our country better and our democracy stronger, but we have to participate. I think that is, that is a crucial thing. And I think immigrants know that. So we're almost at the end, Earl. I want to close with one last question that came in from Nora Shanahan, um, who I think in this moment of sort of ideological um, polarization, asks, what has your career taught you about maintaining productive discourse across ideological gaps? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I was recently listen listening to um, uh, a, a more senior uh, uh, former Foreign Service uh, officer, and he was saying, uh, you know, listening is the most important thing. It's not about always talking all the time. You know, we're the U.S. and we're talking. Um, it's about listening and understanding and listening deeply for comprehension, for understanding what is this other person telling us and why. Um, and not always trying to fill the gap of silence with, you know, I'm just going to, you know, demolish that argument and demolish this argument, but to, you know, to really try to understand and to bridge that gap in a way that hopefully is a good outcome uh, for both parties. I mean, I think that's what you really um, strive for. Well, I really, after an hour of us talking to an audience we can't see in this world of Zoom, I think an appeal to listening is actually a great place to end the conversation because I know there are lots of people out there listening. I know so many people wanted to hear you after your incredible appearance, you know, as this, as this moment of, you know, real dignity in the Foreign Service during the uh, impeachment hearing. And now people have a chance to hear you on a wide range of topics. And I know when your book comes out in January that we'll get to hear from you again. So I look forward to many more opportunities and many more opportunities to listen to you. So Ambassador Yovanovitch, thank you so much for coming back to Princeton. We really are yeah. thrilled that you're here. Thanks so much, Kim. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And bye to our audience. My name is Sabrina King, and I've been working at Princeton for 15 years. I am a 2001 graduate of Princeton. Every year that I spend at Princeton 